Um, the first thing I want to tell you is if you don't have a program, there were programs out in the lobby, so hopefully you have a, a program to get started uh, with. Uh, we're honored that everybody came here. Welcome to the 8th Annual Diversity Day celebration at the NTSB. We appreciate everybody uh, making an effort to get here, especially today uh, on the weather. For those of you on the web, on the online, we had some weather here in the East Coast, so um, a lot of folks are probably streaming in. So we appreciate the effort that you made to be here. Um, we're going to talk about some formal introductions. We'll talk about some emergency procedures. First of all, however, um, I'd like to introduce the U.S. Uh, Postal Service, Postal Police Color Guard, and the playing of the national anthem, and then we'll get officially started. You may be seated. Just a few emergency announcements before we get started. In case of an emergency, the building alarm system will activate and a, a voice message will instruct persons to vacate the building. You should proceed to the nearest exit. There are exits behind me, uh, to my left and to my right, and there's also an exit uh, behind you. Uh, restrooms and telephones are in the foyer to the left of the exit, 
And then I'll also like to add that if you have any cell phones or electronic devices that uh, may disturb uh, the speaker or the presentation, we ask that you adjust those to silent mode. So why Diversity Day? This is the eighth annual event that we've had. And if you've been here for a while, you know that diversity is important to the success of the organization. On the back of your program, in fact, it's listed under our core values. Under excellence, we see that it includes continuously seeking the diverse perspectives in all that we do. And this event is an embodiment of that. Um, if you look in the middle of the program, you'll see that briefly I'll introduce your chairman, who will introduce the speaker, and then Farah, um, our director of diversity and inclusion in the e office of EEO, will close the program. Um, we're privileged and honored to have a speaker from uh, South Carolina State University. He is the president of South Carolina State University, James E. Clark, in Orangeburg, South Carolina, which is about 45 minutes from the state's capital, uh, the home state of our chairman. And uh, he's going to present us a presentation that includes uh, secrets that he's found throughout his career in leadership on confidence, trust, and integrity, and how those three values and principles uh, shape the success of organizations. So we're excited to have him. We're honored to have him here. Uh, we've got distinguished guests in the audience. We've got Member Wayner, uh, Member Dinzar, Member Hamidi, thank you for being here. Our chairman, obviously, Robert Summon, as well as our managing director. So um, we're so honored, and I'll invite the chairman up to give a uh, special welcome to our speaker. Well, good morning, and uh, glad you could be here on this snowy day. It is amazing. I uh, made a joke that we're looking for, what, a snowflake? And, uh, well, we had uh, a lot of snowflakes. Anyway, good morning and welcome. Um, I want to apologize for the lack of diversity at Diversity Day. You see, uh, we seem to have a lot of speakers from South Carolina. <laughs> so I apologize, but next year we're going to get somebody from a northern state, from North Carolina. <laughs> but uh, it is great to be here. I bet James... Clark about 20 years ago, sort of being an airport bum that I am uh, on my days off, I would go hang around the local airport in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and James was out there building an airplane, and uh, he's built several since then. Tim, I know you've got a few RV6s, uh, RVs in your inventory. Um, who, who here has, uh, has or is currently building their own airplane? Has let's see who else. Lauren, I didn't know you you were, didn't know that. Tim, of course, I know that you've got about six airplanes in your garage. Anybody else? I would never ever fly anything that I built, <laughs> but I admire you who admire those who can. Um, as I mentioned, I met James a number of years ago, and uh, I soon learned that not only is a great home builder, uh, but uh, he's a great pilot. And he's been a mentor. He's sort of been the dean of building, of home buildings, where people from all over come to James for guidance and, uh, and I think flight instruction as well. And he's a member of the, when I, met, when I met him, we were both members of the local EAA chapter in Columbia, and then you became the president of that, and you invited me to come speak back in 07 at the banquet. But now he's on the board of EAA on the big board. He was up in Appleton or up in Oshkosh uh, last weekend for a board meeting. James struck me for a lot of reasons, but um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's accurate to say that you came from humble be beginnings. Your parents, one of your parents had a second grade education and another had, uh, had a sixth grade education. James always realized the value of, uh, of education, and did very well, and went to a boys' school up in Massachusetts, uh, MIT. Went to, uh, got, got an undergrad and a graduate degree from MIT, and he has an honorary uh, doctor of engineering science, I think, from, the, from South Carolina State University. Um, I'd kind of lost track of James, and then Beverly was uh, coming back from Oshkosh and saw him uh, on the airplane, and they started talking, and I realized, James is the, now the president of South Carolina State University, a historically black college and university. 
right there in Orangeburg, and I immediately contacted him to see if he would come and be our Diversity Day speaker. Uh, you didn't come to hear me speak. I'm going to sit down. I'd like to introduce Dr. President James E. Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, no, no, it's gotta, you got to bring it better than that. Good morning. Good morning. All right, because I want to make sure that everyone is awake here. I've only had one cup of coffee this morning, so uh, that's my excuse for moving so slowly this morning. Uh, the talk today um, that I'm going to do is one, it is a variation on one that I've uh, actually that I've given before. And I've given variations of this to um, uh, people that are very, very young, like uh, uh, teenagers, as well as people uh, like, like us. Because the fundamentals in this, this particular talk, I think, are, are relevant. And it's particularly relevant, I think, at a, at a session like this, because it talks about uh, the team building and, and, the, and this notion of trust and believing in others and the capacity to do great things when you join forces with, with, um, with others. And as a result, uh, I titled it, I Believe I Can Fly. And as a result of that, I think I can do a whole lot more And as a result of being able to do that. And I, I believe we're going to be switching over to, to, um, to this. And I, we talk about humble beginnings. I come from a place up in the northern Florida, up in the panhandle. That's like southern Georgia, southern Alabama, deep, deep south. And those of you from there you know that uh, the, the more north you go in Florida, the more southern it is. And the more su south you go in Florida, the more northern it is. But I come from a Gadsden County, uh, a little town called Quincy, a lot out in the country, a place they refer to as sawdust. And the, uh, now it turns out that uh, Gadsden County was really kind of interesting when I, when I was growing up there because uh, on the educational system, it was number 66 out of 67. That's not good. But Gadsden County is a kind of a tale of two cities. Uh, the, the represented on the very top, the antebellum homes. Uh, actually, at one time, I think it had the highest per quota. I mean, uh, 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 not per quota. The the uh, um, the normalized uh, value number of millionaires uh, uh, in in the county. But it was also one of the poorest counties. And it, uh, it also was a place that was about uh, I think slightly majority Af African American. And you say, well, how could that be? How could such, such a thing be? Well, a, a lot of it, you know, from way back when, uh, farms and, and the Deep South, but a lot of it was Coca-Cola money. It turns out a lot of the members were family members or friends of the original founders of Coca-Cola, and they had, the local church pastor had told everybody to buy Coca-Cola stock, and I think they had made a, made a lot of money that way. But it, it was a farming country, um, primarily uh, things like corn and tobacco, a lot of tobacco, and it was primarily a place where where the, uh, it became the number one place for what was called uh, shade-grown tobacco, tobacco for cigars and also flu-cured for cigarettes. And so those images there at the bottom represent what life was like for me. And quite frankly, I could be in one of those pictures. I know what the barns are like. I know what the tobacco is like. So you go from something like this, where you're working from sunup to sundown, working on uh, um, primarily someone else's uh, farm, uh, most of the farms, quite frankly, were owned by white individuals. My family was fortunate enough to have a small uh, acreage. But going from that uh, to this, and I show this image here not you know, from, to be bragging, but especially for you to say there's no excuse if you, know, if you, if you believe in and have people that believe in you. Because if I went from working, you know, toiling the soil you know, from time to time, from day to day and so forth, uh, after hours on our farm and throughout the summer, and being able to get to a point where um, uh, I you know, attended MIT and worked at GE, Gillette, and Exxon, and Gould, and AT&T, and we purchased NCR as well, and ended up being president of South Carolina State University, passing through the boardrooms and all around the world and, and we're doing worldwide travel throughout the co on corporate jets and otherwise, if I can get to that point from here, then so can you. And the idea is to say there, is, there should be nothing that, that holds you back. Uh, so from humble beginners, no matter what your beginners are, if you have the right approach and the right mindset and the right support, then it is possible to get there. So you say, well, how did this happen? Well, part of it is this small town inspiration. Now, small town inspiration, you don't, we don't, that doesn't necessarily have, necessarily have to apply to an actual town or city. This could be a town. This could be a community. 
And so the inspiration from a place like this that you can supply to each and every person that walks within your doors can have a miraculous effect on the individual. Now, the individual themselves need to have some long-term desires as to uh, looking forward, um, and they must apply themselves to both gain knowledge and experience in terms of moving ahead. So let's talk about this small town inspiration for a second. That involves first a family or a community or people around you that care. And sometimes uh, the smallest of things make the biggest difference. Now, many of you may not have experienced being the only one of a certain kind, but quite frankly, I would be willing to bet that more of you than most people expect are one of a kind. You found yourself somewhere where you were the only one and may have been the only one from a small town or the only one from way up north or the only one that's very short or very tall or the only one with red hair. And it doesn't have to be just only one of a particular uh, uh, ethnic background. It could be the only one from geographic, the only one from a particular type of school, the only one that started a certain way. And in, in being that, that, it means that, that when someone else around you reaches out to you and expresses that they care, that they care in your worth, they believe in what you have to bring to the table, it up, uplifts you and motivates you to do things. Now, it's not only just caring. You know, in a small town, people care, especially in the Deep South, you kind of have that embracing, caring notion. But back in the day, and I quite frankly, uh, 10 of my 12 years of, of uh, school through high school was in segregated schools. And there you had a family and community that expected a lot of you. Expected a lot of you because they knew that education was part of the struggle. The education was gonna make, make the difference. And that was mentioned you know, my parents, so they were uh, uh, about 10 years apart uh, in age. Uh, my dad was born in 1901. Only got to go to second grade because he had to go to work. My mother, the sixth grade, she had, because she had to go to work. And so I, I tell people that, yes, I was blessed and was fortunate enough to uh, hang out and hobnob with the sons and daughters of kings and queens and potentates from around the world and kids that had gone to the, to the, to the fancies, the richest uh, uh, schools and prep schools and so forth beforehand. But those two individuals were two of the smartest folks that I'd ever known. They simply had not been given the opportunity, the opportunity or the chance to show it. Or like one of my brothers, uh, yeah, I, I went to MIT, but I, I thought he was much better at numbers than I was. He missed out on the opportunity to go to college. And so amongst you, always remember that amongst you, there's people out there that have deep knowledge, deep capability, but they simply might not have had the experience or the opportunity or someone to reach out to them to hold a hand or to point them to a, a certain in a certain direction or to give them the chance to try something or to expose them to something. So you got to have someone that, that cares, someone that, that expects you to do. Like, yes, I expect you. I expect no less of you. And some, some of my um, team members, uh, I've said to, um, to uh, one, uh, one, there was one case wherein one of my cabinet members, a female member, that was, I was pretty tough on. And so some of the people came back to me and said, well, well, why are you being so tough on her? And I told them and I actually told her because I believe in her. Because I know that she can do, do more than anyone has ever expected of her. And so I'm going to hold her to a higher standard because I know she can get there. And it's, it's not because of hate or bitterness. It's out of love and caring that you, this, this expectation of more. And then that leads me to the part where you got to have a family or community of people that really believe, that believe in their heart that you can do it, that you can do a lot more. Because once you get that, then you get to a point where you believe in yourself, that, that believe that you can do it. Now, long-term desires, you know, you, you, that you have all the believing and support. The individual must have some component of that. And sometimes you have to dream. You have to think big. You have to believe that you can do something much, much, much bigger. I was crazy enough way back when, and those of you in the audience are too young to even realize this, but once upon a time, there was no such thing as a laptop computer. And as a matter of fact, once upon a time, the computers, so the computers would take up half of this room. And uh, I remember uh, days when uh, a box this as big as this podium here would be about uh, 10 megabytes. 
Now you have a thousand times that in something that you can put in your pocket, you know, right now and, you know, the uh, size of a penny. Uh, but I had this crazy notion that, you know, when I was an uh, undergrad, that we could build something like a briefcase computer. We could get everything in it. That's what I called it then. It, this notion of laptop wasn't there. And I, I thought about this, but I believed. Uh, the one, only thing, the thing that stopped me from doing it was the, the professor that I needed to do it with didn't believe that I could do it. And so I put it aside. I thought about this notion of a talking computer. And I got there and saw someone doing it, you know, said, yeah, that's cool. But really, the one that was really crazy was this notion of autonomous vehicles, a car that you could get in and say, OK, you know, go from point A to point A. B, this is before GPSs were invented, had this crazy idea that it ought to be possible. You know, so you got to be always believing these bigger thoughts, because at some point in time, it'll lead you to think that, hey, maybe I can make something. I can run something. I can do something. But it might take time. I, I must settle in. I must allow for the delayed gratification and stay with it for a long time. And the same thing applies to flying. Since I'm at the NTSB, obviously I'm going to bring flying into this picture. I'm going to, going to make, make sure that, that that is used as a metaphor for what I'm talking about here. Now, flight, just like life, takes, takes effort. And that effort is, is kind of think, break it up in two parts. There's a written exam that, me, that, that part where you're acquiring knowledge. Well, you're bringing, you know, you're learning stuff and you're putting it up, up, up here. But there's also a practical part, which is the, 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 that practical exam wherein you're exuding the experience. So knowledge is about studying and understanding the fundamentals and, you know, really, really building upon those basics and putting parts and pieces together. It's necessary, but not sufficient. It's, it's great to get all A's and to have all the information. It's great for you to be the smartest person in the room in this area that's associated with what you do at NTSB. But if you only keep it up here, not so great. You gotta have a continuous curiosity to learn more because things are evolving over time. But you also have to be able to apply that. And you must be able to apply that and, and by gaining experience and interacting with the real world and real people as you do it. Because we all need mentors and teachers. We all need people that are supporting us and instructing us because none of us are perfect. None of us have it all. When we get that knowledge and we share it with someone else, then it makes a very powerful team that, that's capable of doing really, really wonderful things. And we all must grasp those fundamentals. And sometimes it might be a little more difficult for, for one rather than another. But if you share that fundamental, sometimes you get the breakthrough and a person explaining something to another individual, you get the aha, and the fundamentals are based on that. So now, learning to fly was kind of like making, it, you know, making all this work. I, I ended up uh, doing my studying actually down in Florida. I was there at, uh, working, and I was uh, uh, asked to come to AT&T to do some computer stuff. Um, but so I ended up getting my experience in, in New Jersey. So I did all the, all the studying, take, took the written exam while I was down in Florida, you know, without flying at all. You know, so I crammed my, you know, head, but I had none of the, you know, the practical experience. But then I went and fl I fly up in New, New Jersey, New York, New Jersey uh, airspace, and that was a, a wonderful, wonderful thing over at Marstown. And so if you do that, if you put all these pieces together, you will find that, yes, in fact, yes, you can. Yes, you can do it. If, in fact, you give it a try, if you believe, if you believe, if you believe, uh, you can do it. You can, find, you can find those dreams. You can build those dreams. You can create those dreams, and you can accomplish those dreams. Now, the dreams, though, sometimes you kind of have to create them yourself. And so sometimes you have to build those dreams. And part of this, um, I've set, set out and doing this particular undertaking is uh, an RB6. Uh, it's done by with my friend uh, Patty. Uh, Patty and I finished this particular plane in 2002. Now, it's a beautiful plane, and it's been a lot of people like you know the way it looks. I like the way it rides. It's a very nice plane. But you know, yeah, it looks looks pretty now, it looks beautiful now. But things are not always uh, as they seem at first glance. And this is what it looked like one late, late, cold, dark, and dreary night at the airport. It was probably about 30 degrees that night when I was told ripping everything out and, and putting in uh, all glass, getting rid of the analog instruments and changing to a lot of new things at the time. Now, it's okay, though. 
It's okay to have this kind of chaos. It's okay to have this chaos if you have a master plan, if you have a dream in mind. Because out of this, over time, things can slowly but surely be brought into, into, into focus and become organized. And you end up with something like this following the master plan. And it turns out now that uh, actually it's been upgraded uh, 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 since then. But it turns, some, it turns out that you, in life, you will also sometimes reach points where there's just, just sheer, sheer confusion. And that, that sheer confusion can look something like this. But uh, and this, is, this is a different airplane. And, but I was, this is another a different hangar, late at night. But I was working with another person, and we were sharing the experience. And so when you share the experience with someone, you can believe, you can get to the point where you believe that you can cross the, over to the other, other side. And this is one uh, different airplane where I started taking one part out, started taking one item out, and, uh, um, uh, oops, looked like we had a problem. Okay, started taking one, one item out, and I was going to do just a little bit. And then I started taking more and more and more. Because I had a friend there working with me, and we were supporting each other, uh, we got to a point where we decided, to rip every wire, switch, sensor, everything out of it and start from scratch. Now, if I would have been there by myself, I would not have had the nerve, the guts, the gumption, the chutzpah to do it. But it was the thing to do. But because I had someone there who was at the hangar with me, work, who was going to work on his plane as well, we were able to share the experience. So sharing the experience allows allows you to get to the point where clarity will prevail. And you see clearly as to what can happen. And this is a shot of actually what the, the panel looked like later on. And yes, this is, a, you know, I know it's more glass than a lot of the earlier planes, probably more than the, the, the Boeings that you flew. Uh, but that's a little plane that's uh, in the hangar back there in Columbia, South Carolina. Now, once you build these dreams and you're fulfilling those dreams, it also becomes part of important to share those dreams. This particular shot here is a um, uh, shot in Alabama. I had just finished flying at an air show and I'd gone uh, in Georgia and I'd gone back to Alabama to the airport of a friend of mine. Um, but the sharing of, of it, of it, of it is, is something that's very, very, very powerful. This particular moment was captured. I'd, I'd stop, and I was sitting, and I was thinking. And I noticed off on the side later there, was a, there were two women that were taking, they were taking pictures. And they had taken this, this picture, and they came and asked if it was okay. And they later sent. And they, their dream was getting certain pictures, and they shared this picture with me and sent a copy of it. And I, I like it because it, it was one of those moments where it was, I know the air show was just over. But sharing the dream of flying and flying with teams and flying in uh, formation and so forth, it was a powerful thing. And as a result, sometimes some really, really amazing things can occur. Now, I know this looks like something really, really bad. It's going to happen. It's going to keep all of you busy for about two years sorting out the pieces. Uh, let me say, no, this did not create any extra work for the NTSB. Uh, and, it, and also, it is not photoshopped. Uh, the, the planes there, that is a very choreographed sequence, and some of it is uh, 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 depth perception because there's four planes that are about a quarter of a mile away the, 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 that are in the back, the ones that are most vertical, but they look a lot closer. And the others, in fact, are in formation. And uh, although the cameras does funny, funny things, the, the plane's about three to five feet apart, no, no wingtip uh, overlap. But it's a powerful thing when a lot of people come with a vision and a very diverse set of people, pilots in this case, from all walks of life, come together. Civilian pilots, military pilots. Um, I almost said younger pilots and older pilots, but we were all pretty much older pilots uh, there. Uh, but it, but, it's, but it's, it was possible. It is possible to do the, have these dreams, but there's uh, no, 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 no free lunch in terms of accomplishing it. Uh, there's, you can have accomplishments, but you also have struggles. And I, and I was the same way. I, you know, had a lot of 
accomplishments along the way in school and college and radio and crew and all that. I fell down multiple times, but get up. And so it's not the falling down, it's getting, getting back up. You know, whether it's the selecting the school with all kinds of things. But when you, uh, when you are having these ups and downs, remember that opportunity will knock along the way. And what you've got to do is be true to yourself. Go with your gut and believe in yourself. Leverage that believing that someone else has, has, has put upon you when someone else has believed in you. Uh, and sometimes you must realize that opportunity will knock when least expected. This, I'll tell you, this is a crazy kind of story here. I use this one here. Um, I, uh, this was, I think I was my freshman year at, at MIT. And growing up in the Deep South, I wanted to play baseball. I played, I played baseball for quite a while, and you know, I, I thought I was all right. You know, I, you know, so I go out, and but it seemed like half the freshman class wanted to play baseball. So you're out there waiting. Anyone in here play baseball? Play baseball? Anyone in here play? Raise your hands. Show of hands. Okay. Now, any of you uh, know what I mean when I say a bad hop? You know exactly what I mean, right? So I've been waiting patiently, waiting patiently. I think it was, uh, position was second base. I wanted to do second base. I think it was. Let's see, second base or shortstop. Anyway, um, I, it doesn't matter because I'm waiting, waiting my turn, waiting my turn, waiting my turn. Because you're only going to get one shot at, you know, fielding the ball. So crack of the bat, pop. And there I go, you know, you, you, you aggressively go to the ball, you're going with it, I'm going down for it, and I, it, it hits a rock or something just before, and you know what happened, right? Boing. So I didn't feel that, so I've got to wait again. And it turns out, while I was there feeling pretty dejected, um, a guy comes by, and it's kind of rare, he's a big guy black guy at MIT that talks to me about being a coxswain in a boat. Because at the times I was probably at least 65 pounds less in weight than I am now, and 10 times stronger because I grew up on a farm, working on a farm, had a very high power to weight ratio, but I was very small. I could, I could make the weight of a coxswain. And the guy in the, in the boat there, Greg Chisholm, says, hey, well, you ought to come out. So now he's like, look, now I grew up, you know, I can't drink all that water. You know, if I fall out of the boat, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I decided to do it. And lo and behold, the, um, the coach, I think, was a Navy guy. And he saw something in me. And he believed in me. And he actually put me as the coxswain of the first, first boat. And at that experience, the coxswain is the coach in the boat. A lot of folks think the coxswain goes stroke, stroke, stroke. Yeah, kind of in the very beginning. But the coxswain is this strategist that steers the boat, and calls out the commands and, and, and the overall strategy of the race and coaches, coaches. And as our coach would say, uh, the only person that gets to talk is the coach and, and, and the coxswain. The oarsman pull hard and you will go fast. Now imagine now my first, uh, my, my first year, the, the young man, and I grew up, and remember, I come from a very segregated world. And the guy that's sitting in front of me is from, my, you know, Alabama or Mississippi, Caucasian, at MIT. And this little scrawny black kid is sitting right there in his face, barking orders. Now, it, you know, I could have taken that a certain way, but the way in which I had to take it was that we are a team. So no matter where we come from, no matter what our backgrounds, we are one team. We are the boat representing MIT in this race when we race against people. And so we, uh, we melded, and over time, you know, we got better and better, and we did okay. We got good enough, though, that the, the next year, the coach asked me to be uh, the coxswain in the elite fours of the top boat that we were going to enter and that headed to Charles, which is the largest race in the world. And we did. And that race is called a coxswain's race. Most races are about 2,000 meters. They're called sprints. This race is over three miles long, and it winds throughout the Charles River, and it's called a coxswain's race because you have to strategize going between the, the bridges and around and the curves and all that. And all the boats are started at least 10 seconds apart. You want to be close. And the farther away you are, the worse. If you get less than 10, you get penalized. Cross the line at 
one, I think, seconds. The coach almost had a heart attack because he thought I was, I was pushing it too close. And we raced the race, and we were, we were catching up on this boat, catching up to this boat, and, and they were, you're supposed to yield and let them pass, and this boat, this person would not let us pass. They, they got away with that, but that's okay. You know, but we, but we maneuvered and moving over. And this is the last turn. We're coming up, uh, the, the, the building that people behind is at the Harvard Boathouse. And I can remember to this day the announcer saying, ladies and gentlemen, the boat coming up now is the Olympic silver medalist of Hobbs, Hobbs, Livingston and Livingston from Harvard, and they are passing the MIT boat. Now, if anyone would have paid attention and noticed the, the sequence in numbers, we had a higher number, which meant that we started by at least 10 seconds behind them. And if we were at them at that point, we had already beat them. But that person could not believe that this ragtag group from MIT, think about the diversity thing, and this ragtag group that's 40% black, come on, wait a minute, you know, has caught the Olympic silver medalist. And that year, we won the head of the Charles, beating not only the U.S. Olympic silver medalists, but a couple of other boats that were faster than them. A very diverse team, the most diverse team that of, of, of rowing uh, that we had seen. And we would have won Henley on Thames, except for an accident, beating all other boats. And the idea here is, remember, and just to be blunt about it, rowing uh, at that time was a very rich, white boys sport. Now, a lot of women are in the crew now, but at the time, if you didn't go to the right prep school, that was nothing. But this diverse boat, this diverse team, had a chemistry that had it firing on our, all cylinders. Now, flight is also, uh, first flight is like the big risk in life. It can be a scary experience, something you remember for the rest of your you know, lifetime, and it's unique. And so we have the opportunity to have these kind of moments in our life to take on something big and to make that dream come, come true. Uh, now, uh, but, but it's, you know, it, it can be scary. But after you do that first flight, you got to be prepared to expand the envelope. For me, it was formation clinic, but later uh, doing training in that, doing later to learning to do aerobatics. For you, your big dream, your big dream uh, could also be your biggest fear, something that you're afraid of, but you want to do. You're thinking about doing it. And we're going to show, show a couple of things of that very, very quickly. And now, they may, in fact, be the same. Formation flying becomes about trusting the team that you're on. You learn to follow, and thereby you learn to lead. As you can follow, you know what you need to do to follow. Then you know what needs to be done to, to lead. You've got to believe in yourself and believe in the team, and thereby be able to trust yourself and trust the team. So it's all about believing and trusting. Now, aerobatic stuff is all by yourself. You've got to believe in self. Whenever you do these things, you're all successful, and you have these wonderful experiences in life, I want to remind you also, remember those who made it possible. And for, you know, there are always someone that went before you. You're standing on the shoulders of other giants that have gone before you. No one gets to do it by, them, by themselves. And for me, when it comes to flying, it's always about Tuskegee Airmen, and I always want to keep them in mind, uh, and eventually I want to do a mini-me uh, of them. And... Um, this all came together for me in terms of fun and flying as part of another team. And uh, on this particular team, if you see the image up there, I'm the short guy that's on the team. Uh, and also, there are a bunch of things that we did for, um, that, uh, that we did, that I've done. One is uh, flying with this team, and also there's something that I did for the uh, Bulldogs back at South Carolina State. And uh, we're going to show you a couple of videos of that. Well, the first one is... Um, the first one I'm going to show is where we, uh, we, this team was the world's largest formation aerobatic team, a 12-ship routine, three sets of four, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. I'm going to show we were flying 11 airplanes at the homecoming of uh, the Blue Angels down at Naval Air Station, Pensacola. This is back in uh, 20, 2012, and it was a, a salute to them, and let's see if we can get this going here. And. The, uh, the F shots uh, was a camera mounted underneath my right wing. We're coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. 
we take a dive as we cross the line. Uh, crisscross, Bravo and Charlie crisscross, and that motion is starting right now, right over the crowd, and it looks like chaos when you're looking straight up. Alpha goes totally vertical, Bravo and Charlie goes off at an angle, and then shoot, game on. And there's a lot of things that goes here, but it's about this team coming together, trusting each other, believing each other, believing what's possible to create something that's magical to have seen from the ground. It's about trusting that each person is going to be in place doing what they're supposed to do when they are supposed to do it. Because quite frankly, life and limb is at stake here if you're not. You must believe in the capacity of yourself. You must believe in the airplane that you built. You must believe in the people that are with you. And if you do that, wonderful, fantastic things are possible. And it comes together with a crowd of applauding and saying, ooh, ah, isn't that wonderful? How do they do that? And as we got better, we expanded the envelope to be able to do it even at night. And that required an extra little bit of effort on our part. But uh, we believed in each other. We trusted each other. We encouraged each other. We trained each other. We supported each other and made, made, it, all, made it all possible. And one other thing that just before, before we, this next one is, whoop, whoop. The next, the next video I'm going to show very quickly because uh, I want to have, be able to do some uh, Q&A at time at later on. As I'm from South Carolina State University, home of the Bulldog Battalion, we've uh, produced more African-American generals or flag officers than any other institution except for West Point, and they had a big, long, long head, head start on us. They produced 26 flag officers, I believe. Last year, we were at 19. Beginning of this year, we got number 20. Later, a month or two later, we got number 21, and we believe number 22 is coming, and we say gaining on you. In this video, I had the opportunity, because in honor of the Bulldog Battalion, to jump with the Golden Knights. And I, I asked you to watch this, and at how many times do I reference our Bulldogs in this promotion? This is doing it on behalf of, uh, yes, I was having fun doing it, but for our Bulldogs, there was no chance, there was no way that I was gonna pass this up to represent for the university. Uh, with this, in about a few seconds, they'll switch over to me and they'll talk to me on the ground. Hey James, how's it going? It's going great. It's a wonderful day today here in South Carolina at McIntyre. I was going to say, you look like you're dressed to do something really exciting today. What are we doing? I'm about to go jump out of an airplane today. You're going to jump out of that airplane right over there. If you look over your left shoulder. Yes, I am. That's the airplane we're going to jump out of. Have you ever done this before? Never jumped before, but from what I understand today, I'm going to be doing it with the world's best team to do it with ever. Absolutely. You're here with the U.S. Army Golden Knights. Uh, let me kind of explain what's going to happen. We're going to put you on that airplane and take you two and a half miles above the earth. Then we're going to throw you out of that airplane. Okay. We're going to come screaming back down at 120 miles an hour. That's good. Sounds like fun, right? Sounds like fun. All right, let's go jump out of an airplane. I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Go Bulldog. That's one. Count the number Bulldog.
outside the airplane. All righty. We had a rigor company out. playing with that the U.S. Army man. Golden Knights. That's it! <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir! Go uh, Dons! <laughs> James, you look like you had yeah. fun, man. Thank it you was a lot, lot a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> That last piece, that last video was also about believing. Believing in others and trusting in the team. You know, some people ask, was I afraid to do the first jump? Was I afraid to leave up to 13.5, you know, and jump out and falling at a certain speed? But I said, no, because I believed in that team. I believed what that team had been doing, that they knew what they were doing, and I trusted in it, that team. So I was able to enjoy the experience because I believed in that. And that's what I want to leave you with. So thank you for being here, and I'd like to take any questions that you may have. <laughs> All right, so is there any question while we get speakers from South Carolina? Any, any subject. <laughs> because we do have great, great speakers from South Carolina. James, I've got a question. I've yeah. always wondered about this ever since I, I, I met you, and I learned of your uh, humble beginnings. And uh, at the time I met you, you were the chief technology officer for, I think, AT&T. It might right. have been NCR at right. the time. I forget which way it yeah. went. But, so what is it, what is it that, that allowed you to see that, you know what, I can, I can get out of these farm fields in in North Florida. What is it that, 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 that inspired you? It, it was, as I mentioned in the first slides, it was both a family and a community that believed and expected more. Believed that I could do more and expected me to do more. Uh, and whether it was my parents, like I said, even though they didn't have the opportunity to get the education, they knew that education was important. And they just expected you to do, to do things. Um, it's kind of interesting, uh, uh, and it's kind of a weird expectation, weird, now weird way of representing it. Again, growing up in a, in a, in a it would have been a segregated you know, place for some time. I mean, let me just tell you how segregated it was. In the county that once upon a time, when I, I remember the newspaper had a section inside that was painted, uh, printed on a different color of paper, and it was called News and Views of Gadsden's Colored People. That's during my lifetime. So the, anything re about someone black was relegated to this section unless maybe you had committed a crime. So uh, I, I was at this uh, part of the 14 integrating this school and I was on the front page. Uh, you know, they have boy and girl of the month and eventually I ended up there and, uh, uh, on the front page. And so my mother was approached by someone at one of the stores. So I said, Annie? 
I see your boys there on the front page of the newspaper. Oh, now, what sport is he in that got him on the front page of the newspaper? Now, my mother was about four foot whatever, you know, and she kind of put her chest out. My boy ain't had to do no kind of sports to get on the front page. He studies his books. And that's kind of the expectation that was there. And that expectation went to people that were at school because they knew your parents. They knew your cousin. They knew your brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts. And if you got out of line, the word got back home before you got there, even without telephones. So the community assumed that you would do, do, do well. You know, whether it was just or, or that, or in the neighborhood or whether it was at church or whether it was at, at school. And you just kind of, you got to the point where you just didn't know any better than to, than to, uh, than to do well and expect to, to do good grades. The other one is uh, someone said to my mother that, you know, she was compliment, they were complimenting me that, that I'd gotten, you know, really good grades and wow, that, wow, wow. You know, isn't that so wonderful? In her own way, she said, well, what else does he have to do? It's not like he's having to go plow the mule every day. All he really has to do is go to school, pay attention to what the teacher says, and do, which primarily, most were, was she, and do what she says. Pay attention, get his lesson, pay attention, get his lesson. Now, of course, why wouldn't he have good grades? So the, the assumption you know, there was no, there was no, you know, kind of pounding on me, you must get good grades. But at the same time, there was no, well, that's okay, James. You know, that's okay. There was this expectation that you were going to do your best, whatever it was. And, and then, you know, you just started to dream big. And for the, the, the final part, I think, was a switch point was um, I saw, there was something called the 21st Century, or the 20th Century, hosted by Walter Cronkite on CBS. And all this cool stuff was happening at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Professor So-and-so this, did this in computers. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. You know, you know, so, and so I said, wow, this is MIT place. This is a cool place. They're doing stuff that I'm really interested in. And um, I decided, hey, that's, I didn't know any better. I want to go to that place. And my guidance counselor, um, uh, she was uh, fresh out of Florida State and, she was, she, was, she was really nice. She, I can tell now that she was trying to, how do I break it to this black kid that maybe you might not get accepted? And I finally said, look, if you're not going to help me, I'm just going to do it on my own. I'm just going to, hey, I'm going to apply. And I did, got accepted and so forth. And she, she up. And, and from there, it's like, okay, man, once you've gone through that fire hose, you say, hey, you know. Did you ever consider a career in broadcasting? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, actually, a lot of my friends was surprised that I did not go into broadcasting. I did 10 years of radio at, uh, up in Boston. I was part of a program that uh, became one of the most popular programs uh, there was. And I, I, I did a lot, uh, and I was, you know, general manager of the station, chief engineer of the station, producer, announcer, all stuff, helped rewire the station and so forth. But the critical thing, the, the rules have changed now, but at the time, you could only own a limited number of stations. And I had figured out that you really couldn't make money, you know, you, it's a good way to, 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 to starve, you know, trying to have a, you know, a, a broadcast facility or a small number. Uh, but now you can have a large number and you can aggregate and get economies of scale. Uh, if times were different, maybe I would have done that. But I was really into computers at the same time. And so a lot of folks were really shocked when I went cold turkey and uh, when I left graduate school, business school, that I didn't do radio anymore. Yeah. Other questions? Any subject, you know. Yes. Uh, Dr. Clark, uh, it's been said that uh, success is a dangerous thing, both personally and organizationally. Uh, you've obviously managed to overcome that, both personally and organizationally. Tell us a little bit about how you did that, uh, particularly as far as organizations are concerned. Um, first of all, I would like to use this expression, um, Nothing breeds success like success. So success breeds success. Uh, I was, um, uh, I guess an example I'll use. I was brought into, I was re recruited by AT&T to come to take over an operation 
that had been losing a lot of money, the, uh, all of their high-end computing at the time, and um, and some of the, some of the uh, people at the organization didn't think that highly of the group. Um, now, let me frame this. October 31st, 1988, on the Wall Street Journal, it says AT&T has won a one point something billion dollar contract, okay, it was FCAC 251, I believe it was, uh, to deliver computers. The next day, November 1st, was my first day, and that was one of the lines of computers that I had to have, you know, produce and deliver on, along with several others. But that team, fast forward, ended up being the most profitable, most successful of all the computer operations at AT&T. Why? Because if you stood back and believed in the people, the reality is I had some of the best managers in the world, some of the best engineers in the world. There were Bell Labs engineers, and I ended up being an executive director of Bell Labs as well, but they were some of the best. And so what they needed to have is direction, people believing in them, people supporting them. And so we, we, with clarity. And so the key was to make sure that we have clarity about what we're going to do, that we have, we, we have drive and energy on what we're going to do, that I'm fully, fully supporting them, you know. Now, we may lock the doors and, and butt heads, but when we come out, you know, uh, I, I guess in the military, salute and execute, okay, but it, it's, it's full steam ahead. But really, really believing in the team and showing them that uh, to, to get to a point where they believe in themselves. And then it becomes infectious, you know, and I end up with uh, three major groups. And each group, when they wanted, they wanted to make sure that their generation of computers that was going to come next and the one that's coming next versus the generation that's paying the bills, uh, that, they were, that they were good, that they were doing it. And so I think just showing a direction, believing, and getting people to believe in themselves is a critical, critical thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Clark, we have a uh, question from the, the web. This is from Kathy Silball, our general counsel. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, she asked, we often hear that millennials are different learners and performers. As president of South Carolina State, or through your other experiences, do you see differences? What do you find motivates your students? I'm still searching. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, millennials are different. Uh, I, it's kind of strange uh, back about uh, 15, maybe 15 years ago, you know, when, when you're the kind of a chief technical officer, you have to talk about future strategies, you know, 5, 10, 20 years out. And we talked about interconnected societies and so forth, uh, and, I, and I came up with this phrase of once we reach a point of the ubiquity of connectedness, then people get to a point where the communities that they are operating in of virtual communities, the digital communities, and they go at the speed of light and you know more about a person a thousand miles away than you know about your person right next door. And that creates a society that's not really consistent with how we operate today, but it creates a me, 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 now, 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 now society. And so I think a lot of millennials are, 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 are I always use the word, a victim of that because everything is so instant, you know, everything is right here. You text someone, you want a response right now, you know, let's roll the clock back 100 years or more. You know, if you wanted to write a letter to someone in, in Europe, you know, it would be months. So you had to think about what you were going to say. You know, and then over time it became, you know, weeks. You know, there was this thing called air mail, you know. To get across the country would be days, you know, before you get a response back. And eventually we got to the point of, you know, email. And, but eventually, immediate things. So there's a certain level of uh, immediacy, which I think leads to a willingness to throw away. Which means I think that there's, there's you know, if, if you have limited resources, uh, any of you, anybody here old enough to know what a hollerith card is? A punch card? Okay. Punch card. Okay. I should say computer punch cards. Okay. When you only have one run per day, you sat down and you thought about it. You didn't just throw something on the screen and hope it would work, throw something on the screen. So I think what we have society-wise, not just with millennials, so I'm not, not picking on millennials, I think society has evolved to, to a point where we're, we're willing to throw things away and not spend a deep thought on items or issues uh, 
that maybe we could, or how we speak to someone even. So we'll put something out there and just throw it out there and just you know, it becomes a throwaway. And I, we're going we're, we're gonna to have to deal with that. I think there's going to be, we, we're going to see in another 10, 20 years, we're going to see the impact of that because um, things are, many things are not as, as deeply thought about as, um, as maybe they could be. Probably not a politically correct answer, but that's that's what I think. <laughs> uh, one, Hello, uh, Doctor yeah. Clark. <laughs> oh, good afternoon, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice, of course, meeting you at Oshkosh. Yes. And um, my question is, you shared your journey, and you and I talked about being um, African American. Did you have mentors and sponsors that? helped you along your journey? And do you think that maybe we need to seek out sponsors? Because mentors will mold us and help us. But we need that sponsor who's going to go out on a limb for us and take us to the next level. Did uh, you have any? Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Again, I want to go back to the community and family level, you know, but... But, but then there's a different level of sponsorship. And, I, and I, a person comes to mind. My undergraduate, uh, my advisor at, at, at MIT, when I went to go to business school, a uh, guy named uh, Bruce, Dr. Jim Bruce. And he, you know, if he ever hears this, he probably doesn't even realize it. Uh, he wrote, he was a dean, associate dean of all of engineering. But he wrote this most powerful letter, believing in me, about going to graduate business school. And I remember, he, it was kind of like, this is, this is a person that we, will, that we can expect more from, we will get more from, and we won't regret, you know, kind of like we won't regret it. So he, he didn't have to go as far as he did. You know, he could have just said, oh yeah, you know, consider James. But he was like a sponsor there. And yeah, throughout all of us, all of us have people that are, that uh, sponsors at different levels. So sponsor doesn't have to be a lifelong undertaking. You know, sponsorship can sometimes happen in a few minutes. You know, sponsorship can be as simple as putting in a good word for somebody that says, you know, I believe in that person and you should give that person a chart. And it makes a, it makes a world of difference. And I think the world of difference is how the, the, the recipient, the receiving entity uh, looks at you and how you're positioned and your likelihoods of success. So yes, in both mentoring and sponsoring. Yeah. One more. Hey James, so I just want to give recognition to Florida natives. So hey, hey. <laughs> gotta love them. Um, but uh, so it sounds like you you basically have this yes man philosophy with a lot of opportunities that you were given. But it seems like one of the challenges today for recent graduates is that they first off come out with the soul crushing large amounts of student debt. But many of the opportunities they have um, to work in places are underpaid or unpaid like internships in places like New York, LA, and Washington, DC. And it seems like for those people that don't already come from money, that this is a big burden, a big challenge to be able to get into those opportunities. So what advice do you give your recent graduates or what solutions do you think uh, work well for this upcoming problem for this generation? Uh, yeah, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question because I've had some students that, you know, they they don't want to they don't want to have any debt. I mean, I've had a student that's one semester to go, and and she didn't want to take out a loan for twenty five hundred dollars or whatever, you know. Or some, and I said, well, wait a minute, you spend more than that on the phone every year, and this is an investment in your life. So having some debt, student debt, on this is for me is because I had some, is not a bad thing. It's an investment. It is an investment in you. It is the single most valuable investment you can make. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, uh, am I going to buy a car? How much is a car cost? 20, 25, 50, 75, $1,000, whatever. Am I going to buy a house? How much does a house cost? 100, 200, 300, 400? I'm going to invest in that. So we're, in, we're willing to invest $200,000 in an apartment probably here. But we're not necessarily willing to invest the $200,000 in our, in our lifetime, in our future. So having some debt on the surface, for me, is not a bad thing. Now, 
What you have to do, I believe, getting internships early on is critical. And that's something at NC State that we've, we're working on doing a lot more. Because internships allows that exposure, allows the opportunity for that marriage to occur. A lot of courting and dating gets sense to go on between you know, someone that potentially is a future hire. Such that what you really want is a situation where not only is there internship that are, that are, that are, that are, that internships, but they are paid, you know, there's some, some pay. And yeah, there are people that can afford to have take unpaid internships, but there are a lot of companies that will pay you to be an intern because it's a cheap way for them to learn to get the best talent. And if you have interned at a place, then the opportunity for the likelihood of you getting a job there is significant. And once you get a job there, just a, the willingness to, 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 to pay that debt uh, and, and, and the choice that I took personally was, hey, I'm used to living like a student, so I'll continue living like a student for a while and pay that debt off and get it off so I, so I don't even have to worry about it. So I don't, I, don't, I don't allow that to be a burden mentally, psychologically. Now, yeah, do we have a lot of debt? Do students have a debt? Is there a big debt out there? Yes. The debt is out there because we've, what we've got to do a better job of is preparing our students such that they have talents and skills that are highly sought after uh, by, by the industries that they plan to enter such that they can be paid well uh, and then go and, and, and pay the debt off. Now, if you, though, go to school and, and your field, your studies don't uh, yield a, a working opportunity for you, then, yes, you could be saddled with a long debt, a lot of debt for a long, long time. One of the things that we, that we struggle with in the country, though, is the, the, what it costs roughly the same, education-wise, to get a degree to be a teacher than, let's say, to be an engineer. But if you're an engineer, you might get paid four times what we would pay a teacher, three or four times. And that disparity, you know, that's, now that's something that has to be has to be dealt with you know, in our industries. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is those people that have the skills of being teachers are going to start working in corporations as trainers you know, in the education field, the knowledge transfer field, where they can make a lot more money. And over time, we will suffer. And we won't have the kind of teachers that I had that embrace you and mentor you and really, really uh, care about you every day and, 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 and push you to the, to the level at which you can achieve. Any more? I think, I think I'm about to get the hook. Is there anything else? Uh, if there's anything else, just put me off on the side. Thank you very much for hanging out with us. Small tokens of our appreciation. I got it. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. For helping us on our journey to number one. Yes. And thank you for feeling innovation at NTSB. So when you drink your coffee, you can think about it. It's empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. did, did, couldn't you tell I need some more coffee? <laughs> no. Thank you so thank much you. for your travel up here. I want to say, I want to thank you. I want to thank the board members. I want to thank the chairman's office. Um, the chairman knows um, I lost my staff um, and I'm by myself. And your collaboration on this event, I just, I just want to Thank you so much for everything you did. Um, I could not have done it without you. And I want to thank the board members. I want to thank the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. I want to thank USPS, who's not here. But I want to sum it up with what you said, believe in yourself, believe in others, and one day you can fly. But I, I want to make one point. Diversity is important, but inclusion is even better. And I think I got that from your presentation. You can have a diverse group, but if you don't use the mindsets that you have on board, you've lost a lot. And how many game changers are in the room? Game changers, what? What? So <laughs> some training we took with uh, the former director of uh, diversity and inclusion at, at OPM. And we understand here at NTSB that we are safer together. And that's what you demonstrated to us. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Farah, uh, really, thank you very much um, for all you do. You mentioned the uh, the DIAC, the DIAC. Does anybody know what that is? Diversity the, inclusion, advisory yep, diversity inclusion, diversity and inclusion advisory council. If you're on the DIAC, please stand.
Thank you for what you do. Ivan, you are the, the chairman, and uh, thank you for what all, all you do. I think there's a, including Farah, who's an ex officio member, we have about 15 people on the DIAC. A lot of people joined us via webcast. If you would kindly raise your hand so I can, yeah, lots of people uh, on the webcast. So a um, um, lot of people never get thanked. Deidre was down here before 8.30 to make sure everything worked. Deidre, I can't see you up there, but thank you for being here to, to worry that the technology was going to work. Mike, Mike Hughes, I want to thank you. Of course, Farah, James being here to take photographs. We had our uh, folks from the CIO's office here this morning to also help us with the uh, perceived computer problems that, for the most part, held off. So, um, anybody else? Just want to make sure that we recognize those who work behind the scenes to to make all of this work. Thanks. Keep up the great work. And as James said, those of you who work, have the pleasure of working with me, you're supposed to laugh. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Know that behind closed doors, I'm going to push. But James, I think you summed it up well, because I know we have the capability to do things even better than we do. We do have great people here. We have a great mission, and we are going to continue to strive to be even better. We can fly. And thank you. Thank you for being here. Be safe.